health outcomes, changes due to interventions. To bring positive change, patient experiences and health must both improve. Healthcare costs must be lowered, and clinician and staff burnout has to end. But our problems are big. 133 million Americans have at least one chronic disease. Half a million people are dying every year from hospital errors, injuries, and infection. The shortage of primary care professionals will be as much as 100,000 in just the next five years. Big problems require bigger solutions. Positive change needs acceleration. It needs to happen now. But these are not so easy solutions that many don't want to hear, and even few are willing to talk about. How to lead such a change? How to discover, discuss, and disrupt healthcare to make a difference now? This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action. Good afternoon, and welcome to our first Vitals of 2024. Vitals is leadership in action, impacting healthcare. It's an open venue where we hear from some of our nation's greatest leaders and how they apply the tools of vitals, value, innovation, technology, advocacy, leadership, and service to improve healthcare and healthcare outcomes for our communities and for our nation. Today, I'm honored to welcome Jessica Sublett, president and CEO of Bounce Innovation Hub. Jessica is a leader with a passion for technology innovation and entrepreneurship who has dedicated her career to supporting entrepreneurs and economic development in Northeast Ohio. In the role as president and CEO, Jessica is responsible for overseeing the vision and strategic direction of the organization. With a major focus on medical technology innovation, Jessica is helping companies to bring solutions to patients to improve healthcare access and outcomes. In her role, she is also leading the development of an entrepreneurial ecosystem in medical innovation in Ohio. As part of that effort, she will be leading Kinetic Labs, a new joint venture between Bounce Innovation Hub and Northeast Ohio Medical University. Prior to being named CEO at Bounce, Jessica served as the Chief Operating Officer, helping to create a powerful resource to support startup companies and drive significant economic development in the region. Under her leadership, Bounce has grown to become one of the benchmark business accelerators in the country. Jessica led programming, structure, and team development to implement and execute on programmatic priorities and strategic initiatives for Bounce, where she was instrumental in launching Bounce's technology incubator program, its software accelerator program, and its GROW program. As a licensed attorney, she utilizes her background in technology transfer and intellectual property law to help shape programming that supports the region's most innovative startups and is keenly focused on developing and building an inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystem. Jessica earned her JD and her certificate in intellectual property law from the University of Akron School of Law and her LLM in intellectual property from the University of Akron School of Law and her BS in business management from the University of Finley. Jessica has served in many leadership roles, including Leadership Akron's signature class 38, where she underwent Leadership Akron training, a 2021 Greater Akron Chamber 30 for the Future Award recipient, and a 2023 Cranes Cleveland Business 40 Under 40 Award recipient. She has done amazing things. Jessica, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. Share my screen. I really appreciate you having me here today. I'm excited to talk about something that I'm really passionate about, and that's collaboration. In my own work, I've leaned into collaboration to drive forward progress and help build a vibrant ecosystem. As a leader of an innovation hub, I firmly believe in the value of partnerships over empire building. Partly because I know that I, nor my organization, can do this work alone, 
but also because the knowledge share that it's gained through collaborations will take you further than you originally imagined. In Stephen Covey's famous book titled The Speed of Trust, he states that business moves at the speed of trust, stressing that trusted relationships are critical for any high performance successful organization. Trust is a catalyst that accelerates business, promoting collaboration, efficiency, and adaptability. Businesses that prioritize and cultivate trust are better positioned to thrive in a rapidly evolving and competitive environment. In other words, people make things happen for those they trust. If business moves at the speed of trust, then healthcare innovations accelerate when trusted collaborations exist. True collaborations are action-oriented. They are more than formal partnerships or affiliations. Rather, collaborations are a commitment to building something together. While we all know that competition drives a free market economy, competitive environments and in innovative settings can hurt progress. A March 2022 Forbes article cited that the science behind why collaborative environments increase productivity. In a study by evolutionary biologist William W. Muir, Experiments in livestock breeding determined that comp competition among domesticated plants or animals can have a dramatic negative impact on yield of a standard farm. Muir found that breeding designed to produce more passive rather than competitive hens eventually allowed the chickens to become healthier and produce more eggs than they previously did. This was in large part because the more passive chickens were no longer aggressively competing with each other for food or other resources. The chickens, like us, have a common goal. For the chickens, it's to lay more eggs. For us, it's to accelerate healthcare innovations through the commercializ commercialization process. When we're working together, we all win because we're not so directly competing for resources. Now, this is not to say that commercializing a healthcare technology is not competitive. It's highly competitive. Uh, and you will most certainly be competing for limited resources. However, the environment for innovating is substantially more productive when it's infused with collaboration. I'm a student of the Kauffman Foundation's entrepreneurial ecosystem building theory, which believes that innovation thrives in dense networks. Collectively, we can drive more impact than we can alone. The Kauffman Foundation believes that a thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem includes several key elements, but the one most relevant for my points today is around culture. In the foundation's most recent ecosystem builders playbook, they share that an ecosystem culture that is rich in social capital, the networks, norms, and social trust that facilitate coordination and cooperation for mutual benefit is like rocket fuel for entrepreneurial growth. An ecosystem will struggle without a culture of collaboration, cooperation, and trust that inspires people to move quickly, help each other, and be open to novel ideas. Creating a collaborative culture for innovation doesn't have to be difficult. In my mind, there are three essential components to building this collaborative, trusting environment. First, we have to define winning as a group. What do we want to accomplish? What does success look like? What do we each want to get out of this? Certainly, there's a greater good component, but skin in the game and tangible incentives keep collaborators motivated and committed. For example, a medical device entrepreneur ultimately wants to grow their business and hopefully one day be acquired. Hospital systems may want to increase efficiencies and reduce costs. However, both want to help clinicians deliver high quality, effective and efficient patient care that improves outcomes. Each party has their own definition of winning, but they come together for a common goal that supports the entire collaboration. When we're honest with each other about our expectations and how winning will impact our own institutions, we better understand each other's motivations and we strengthen our commitment to each other. The second component to know, the second component is to know what you are and know what you're not. There's a tendency to think that we can be all things to all people. There's certainly a time and place for expansion, new opportunities, filling unmet needs, but there's tremendous value, not to mention opportunity, in understanding if there are others who may be better suited to fill this void. For a collaboration to really work, you need to be honest with yourself and your collaborators about what you're good at and where your weaknesses may lie. 
honesty and transparency build trust among partners. There's also a psychological warm, fuzzy feeling when you know that you're helping someone. It doesn't always have to be rooted in altruism, particularly if there's a win in it for you, but feeling appreciated strengthens the bond between people. It helps satisfy our longing for healthy attachment. When we understand the role we play in an ecosystem, we value the roles that others play. We start to form the foundation of trust that enables us to move quickly in our joint work. And then we need to take it a step further. We need to move from collaboration to coordination. This part is important. How can we align strategies, budgets, and personnel to accomplish our shared and individual goals? How do we embed this collaboration into the fabric of our individual work so that it remains a priority? When we open up our strategies, our budgets, and our teams to support one another, we not only strengthen the relationship between organizations, but we more effectively utilize and leverage resources. We create more opportunities for new ideas to flourish through creative brainstorming across broader teams, and we increase the speed for new solutions. These can be accomplished when we take the time to build relationships. And I'm certain everyone in this room understands the value that their network brings. Now, the fun part is that healthcare innovation ecosystems are among the most complex. Innovations emerge from a dynamic interplay of, from various sources driven by the collective efforts of diverse stakeholders within the healthcare ecosystem. Research and development conducted by academic institutions, research centers, and for-profit companies is a primary catalyst. The growing influence of technology and data in healthcare has given rise to a new wave of innovations. Startups and incubators play a crucial role, offering a fertile ground for experimenting with novel ideas and disruptive technologies. Overall, the landscape of healthcare innovation is multifaceted with contributions coming from many sources. So how can we manage through all these various players, ensure that we bring the best innovations of the market and also do so with haste and urgency? We need to create strong collab collaborations between players. I tend to think about the collaborative ecosystem in two buckets. The first encompasses knowledge and talent or collectively brains. These are our inventors, our entrepreneurs and our clinical experts. These are the folks whose brains hold the key to unlocking the future of healthcare innovations. These include the students and faculty at our universities and medical schools, our collective teams at our hospitals and our healthcare systems, and individual entrepreneurs, inventors, and innovators. The density of knowledge and talent these individuals bring to an ecosystem is critical for its success. These people will create the new ideas and equally as important, help validate the new ideas. As much as we need new ideas, we also need experienced leaders to provide critical feedback, serve as champions in their networks, and guide innovations to the decision makers who can move advancements forward. One of the most powerful ways that a clinician can support innovation is by lending just a brief portion of their time and honest feedback. By making themselves available to an entrepreneur or inventor, an idea can be validated or invalidated. We want the highest potential ideas moving forward so that we don't drain resources from the already competitive ecosystem. The second group includes the champions, conveners, and support systems, or who I refer to as people motivated by others' success. These include your economic development professionals, mainly incubators, innovation hubs, and accelerators, but it can also include government staff or regional economic development organizations. People who work in this space are only successful when their clients are successful, so they're motivated to make things happen for them. They are natural conveners of people, networks, and the broader ecosystem, and can generally help to provide access to shared resources, including research facilities, databases, funding opportunities, and specialized equipment. This access allows innovators to overcome financial and logistical barriers, promoting more efficient and cost-effective launches. This group also includes universities, hospitals, and healthcare systems but with a focus on the administrators and the business decision makers. These are folks who set strategies, craft policies, and make guidelines that embrace innovation and support the growth of the research enterprise. They encourage their teams to take risk, to lend a helping hand, and to think about the big picture. 
new, invent new inventions, patents, and startups can yield licensing revenue back to the institution. So supporting innovation is truly a win-win scenario. I also include business advisors, mentors, consultants, and professional service providers in this category. These folks can often be accessed through incubators or accelerators, reducing the overhead expenses associated with launching a startup. And whether they're accessed through an incubator or a fee-for-service engagement, these folks have significant understanding of bringing products to market, navigating regulatory pathways, supporting intellectual property protection, and helping to determine if a product might be reimbursable through insurance providers. They play a vital role in sharing their knowledge with entrepreneurs while also connecting them to broader networks. Finally, an ecosystem needs funders to support the earliest stages of commercialization. Oftentimes this begins with government funding coming from state or federal commercialization grants. It also needs angel investors, individuals who believe early in the value of innovations. And it needs formal venture and equity investors who also have the networks and access to other resources to move the innovation forward. All of these individuals and entities play a role in a healthcare innovation ecosystem. It's nearly impossible to go at this work alone. That's why it's critical to build relationships and collaborations. It's not to say that every one of these players has to be connected to every other one of these players, but when you're connected to one, you're indirectly connected to the rest. A high functioning innovation ecosystem works like the network effect. The more parties that are involved in the work and connected to one another, the higher value and utility the ecosystem provides to its individual players. This is where collaborations come into play. When strong, trusted relationships exist between the players of an ecosystem, it becomes easier and faster to navigate. You eliminate the steps you need to actually take to get to your next meaningful step. This is why collaboration is essential to accelerate healthcare innovation. I don't have to tell this audience that the United States healthcare system is complex. That's probably being generous. Because of this complexity, the process to commercialize a healthcare technology is not straightforward, particularly as compared to other industries. That's because you don't just have one customer to create alignment with. You have several and each have a different priority. For example, a solution and its value propositions have to align with patients, physicians, and other care providers, hospitals, administrators, and ultimately insurers. These competing inter interests aren't always clear or permanent. It's critical to have support along the pathway to understand how to navigate the potential roadblocks. Entrepreneurs go through the validation process by performing customer discovery, a series of several, literally hundreds of interviews with potential and real customers. These steps always get progressively more difficult and only the most successful ideas truly validate the business model fit. But this challenge is dramatically exacerbated by the complexities of our healthcare system. In a collaborative ecosystem, entrepreneurs and founders can receive guidance to anticipate and address the reasons that disruptions occur in the transition from one stage to the next. Challenges and needs are abundant in healthcare, but ensuring that your solution agrees with all of these stakeholders in the decision-making chain across the stages of commercialization is virtually impossible without support. At the earliest stage, problem solution fit, a founder discovers a deep customer problem in an underserved market and has created a solution in which they believe outperforms the current solution. This is a crucial early stage concept in the development of a successful product or service, emphasizing the alignment between a company's proposed solution and the actual needs or pain points of its target audience. The business aims to validate that the problem it seeks to address is a genuine and significant concern for its customers and that their innovation actually becomes a proposed solution to that problem. Achieving this alignment involves thorough market research, customer feedback, and iterative development to ensure that the solution effectively resolves the identified problem. A collaborative ecosystem supports founders at problem solution fit by making introductions to potential customers and helping, that, helping them identify early adopters, which are essential at this stage. 
Clinical leads who will both champion the solution and provide critical, relevant, and honest feedback quickly will help founders understand if their solution is worth taking it to the next level. Additionally, founders can access technical expertise or guidance. Founders can't and startups can't afford to hire all of the technical experts they possibly could on their team. So if you can tap into clinical expertise, it moves the needle forward. When you achieve problem solution fit, you should have some early evangelists who will work to support and champion and advocate for your solution. For product market fit, things get a little trickier. The next stage represents the optimal alignment between the product or service and the needs and preferences of a specific target market. Achieving product market fit signifies that a company has developed a solution that resonates with its intended customer base, creating a harmonious match between the product offer, what the product offers and what the market demands. This alignment goes beyond simply having a functional product that solves a problem. It implies that the value proposition, features, and user experience of the product effectively address the pain points and requirements of the broader identified market segment. Product market fit is a dynamic state and achieving it often requires continuous iteration, customer feedback, and fine tuning to ensure that the product evolves in sync with the changing dynamics of the market it serves. Once achieved, businesses are better positioned to scale their operations, attract additional investment, and solidify their market presence. This is where we see a lot of companies make their first pivots. A collaborative ecosystem drives this knowledge gathering. It's essential to reach far and wide for feedback. So connections with ecosystem partners with broad networks are extremely valuable. And because time and funding is ticking away, it's important to move quickly so that iterations can be made and conversations can continue. It's here that access to venture and equity investments will be crucial to plan for the potentially long regulatory process. Founders rely on expert guidance to help navigate the regulatory system and rules effectively while understanding that their regulatory pathway also has implications on their go-to-market strategy. Access to affordable preclinical and clinical testing facilities, prototyping labs, early stage manufacturing facilities, and investment help the startup spend its capital on building its team and its technology, both of which will be necessary to move to the next stage. Further, startups start the process of understanding the revenue model and the decision makers along the way for their purchasing journey and who will ultimately that progress. And finally, ever growing in its complexity, small and specific characteristics of its market and industry. Just as product market focuses on the alignment of a product with customer needs, business model and its harmony between what it creates, delivers, and has value. And the needs of being this requires a understanding of market conditions. Getting to this point means that a startup has been able to access all of the players required to provide such a comprehensive understanding of its ability to deliver value to healthcare and its own venture, undoubtedly with the help of many collaborations built along the way. They validated product market fit and moved forward to pricing models and understanding their reimbursement model and insurance codes. It's at this stage that we see a a lot of our large healthcare innovation acquisitions. So leveraging the ecosystem's connection to venture, private equity, and particularly private industry is essential. The best part of companies reaching this stage is that our ecosystem generally gains another angel investor, an early startup evangelist, an entrepreneur who values the support the ecosystem provided to them and is ready to give back to the next early stage founder. I truly appreciate the time and attention you've given I hope my passion for working together and the value it provides was demonstrated and that I've inspired you to see how you can contribute to new innovations in your community. So I'll leave you with these. What role can you play in your ecosystem? And how can you support as many wins for as many people as possible?
And Jessica, I thank you. To Monica for questions. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was so uh, in uh, just the insight into that to starting a business is incredible. Um, I'm curious though, just so everyone understands, I think there's a little bit of sketchiness with the internet. Um, so you may be breaking up. So I may ask you things a couple of times just in case. However, uh, we have a record at attendance right now. We had a record registration and we've got 148 people in here right now. And I know a lot of them have to have questions. So if you guys would, please put them in the Q&A and I will get to them as soon as I possibly can. Meanwhile, um, I want to I want to start off with something you mentioned when you're talking product fit, you're talking business model. Um, if somebody has a concept, how do they know if that concept is already in the market? And does does Bounce help with that? Yeah, absolutely. So first step is research. There's all sorts of avenues out there. And I always tell people start with Google. Google's a great starting point but it doesn't have all the answers. So coming to an organization like Bounce or another uh, incubator or accelerator will help an entrepreneur navigate those questions. So part of that is doing your, you know, some of your own research, looking into the market. But if you find an organization like Bounce, we can help make additional introductions to maybe clinicians or otherwise to see what else is out there and even maybe do a patent search. So if somebody has an idea and it's something that nobody else has, obviously, and they want to pitch for private funding, do you guide them through that? And if so, what makes the perfect pitch? Yeah, so we do guide uh, our entrepreneurs through pitching. Um, we take people a few steps backwards before we go forward. So we want to make sure, uh, as I the last part of my, my conversation here is all about feedback. So we all have really cool ideas and we all think they are the best thing. But at the end of the day, we don't buy our product. A customer buys our product. So we need to get the feedback from our customers. So the number one most important part of a pitch is, is there a market and is there market demand? And that's going to take some research. Um, and you tell a story. You need to really articulate a problem or an unmet need, and then how your proposed solution solves that problem or fills that unmet need. And is that need large? What is the size of this problem? Can this venture actually make money? Will it be able to raise funds? And will the people who give it money get a return on that? So that's absolutely a big piece of what we do. So how involved is Bounce in helping individuals get maybe federal grants? Do you guys help write the grants or, you know, what's the, how does that work? Sure. So we don't write the grants for the clients, but there are um, organizations in, particularly in Northeast Ohio that do support that. There is uh, an entity in Northeast Ohio called the Ohio Aerospace Institute that actually does some small business innovation innovation research and small business technology transfer grant workshops. So those organizations can help put together the framework. Um, and some of these uh, grants that are happening at that stage, universities, tech transfer offices will at times support the development of that grant because it's oftentimes a, a university spin out. So Bounce focuses on, you know, just such a wide variety of different entrepreneurship and different business types. How much of Bounce is dedicated to healthcare innovation and that sort of thing? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that I could put particularly a percentage on it, so to speak, but we do uh, on our technology programming, uh, we focus on healthcare, med tech, life sciences, software and IOT and polymers and advanced materials. Um, healthcare does represent a, a significant portion of that. I would say 30 to 40% of our clients are in the healthcare space. I also noticed that uh, you have women at the top leadership of Bounce. What advice would you give uh, to other women who may be interested in the medical innovations environment? Yeah, I, I think part of um, being in this space is 
having a mentor and, and learning about it. I, I entered this space through the world of technology transfer and um, just being absolutely fascinated supporting faculty and graduate students in their own pursuit of startups. Um, but it, it, we are, we're kind of making a comeback here, women, that we are starting to dominate the workforce. So I would say find another female leader and see what advice they might have. But I would say get connected and, and find someone who can help you. Does, uh, here's a question. Does Northeast Ohio's manufacturing history and current robust medical sector make this the ideal place for accelerating medical innovation? Or does it limit our disruptive lens because we already know how to make things? No, oh, I absolutely think this, this is a fantastic place for medical innovation. We have robust hospital systems, incredible universities, and by the way, a much more affordable cost of living than our friends on the coast. So absolutely, this is a place where you can attract top tier talent, not only to live, but to have the right access to resources. And this is an incredibly collaborative ecosystem. So for all of our attendees who are even thinking maybe one day they would love to create something and get it from the lab to the bedside, um, we have a Q&A section, please. You have somebody who can answer any question you may have. Please put it in the Q&A section. Um, meanwhile, I'm curious to know, there is it's so difficult for a young researcher to even get a project off the ground, usually because there's just no money. So when you have a concept that is so broad, um, how do you convince somebody that's it's a good idea to even get the research started so they can even begin to figure out, is it going to work? Yeah, I think some of that, um, some of it comes from within. There's, there's a, a whole um, world out there, a debate of whether you can teach the entrepreneurial mindset or whether you're born with it. So I think there's a, there's a piece of it that there's a, a, a part of you that wants to see if that challenge, if you can overcome that challenge. But I think key to bringing a, a researcher technology forward is really understanding what the market's saying. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? You know, a, a business that is has identified a tangible problem and, can, and create a solution to address that will be able to attract funds. And so my advice would be, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Uh, another question from our attendees, how can Cleveland and Akron collaborate better? It seems the region would be even more impactful if the cities work together. Yeah, I think I, I, I think we work pretty collaboratively together. I think there's um, organizations like Bounce that serve the entire region. You know, we serve from the lake all the way down to the, the southernmost border of, of the region. So I think part of that is making sure that those barriers are down and that all parties are open to collaboration. Um, I think that the, the hospitals and the universities work really closely together. So I do think there's quite a bit of progress here in this region. Certainly we can do more when you look at other regions that like Boston area and Raleigh Durham, where they, they do have a huge metropolitan area where everyone's sort of working together. I think it would move our entire region forward if we called it Northeast Ohio. We are the Northeast Ohio region. Um, compared to other areas of innovation and entrepreneurship, is it more difficult to be successful in the highly regulated medical space? And if so, why? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's several players to this, right? There's lots of varying aspects, lots of different customers, and it's very expensive. It is a long haul. You have to be in it for that long haul. You have to be committed to the fact that your solution is solving that problem, but you also have to be willing to hear the critical feedback that it's not. Um, and this process is very difficult. We see a lot of pivots. We we help a lot of companies that get to a point, they've fundraised on one idea, and then they've pivoted that's okay. That's actually great. That means you're listening to the market. You're listening to the feedback. If we hang on to our ideas and we don't take feedback, it's going to be even harder to move forward. Do most investors understand medical commercialization regulation or does it scare them away? I would 
say no and it would scare a lot away that said there are some very specialized venture funds that are this is their focus area they understand they're in it for the long haul the return on investment that happens for a software product in a couple years is multiplied times five you know you've got an eight to ten year runway before you're going to see that return there are sophisticated investors out there that understand that timeline and that's also where you think about is there an industry partner that might be willing to acquire this idea or this technology? Does Northeast Ohio have um, more access to these venture capitalists who who are who know what we already do and and might be more interested in what we're going to do next? Yeah, Northeast Ohio does have some great investors in this space. There are several private investment funds that have a strong focus on healthcare. There are some more. Uh, for example, university hospitals and uh, Jumpstart in Cleveland operate a healthcare focused fund, Cincy Tech in Cincinnati, but that's just you know two examples of several um, that exist. And the great thing about an ecosystem and about collaboration is that you have access to networks that are outside of your region. So what else is essential to um, having a high function in collaboration? Yeah, I think one of the core pieces of that, you know, I, I did mention it, but that trust, you know, it takes some time to establish and, um, but I don't think it can be rushed. You, you have to spend time to get to know each other um, and really understand what are the roles and responsibilities um, that goes to what are you good at? What's a collaborator good at? What hole can you fill for that person? Um I work with several contractors who I would deem are the commercialization experts. I know what I'm good at. I'm really good at convening the right kind of people and bringing them to the table. Um, and I know a thing or two about commercializing startups, but I lean on those team members to coach the entrepreneurs, teach the entrepreneurs, bring them forward. And the other piece is a clear definition of winning. You know, what, what does that look like? And if you keep moving towards that clear definition, that that's really important. But how difficult is it for somebody who's, who it may be perceived as too young to have that worldly business experience and that sort of thing. Um, is there anything they can do to overcome that? To overcome uh, just the, just the, the stereotypical thing, you know, for somebody who wants to give them money, maybe, you know, you have nothing on your backs yet. You know, yes. you have not, not the longest resume, if you will. Yes. I that's surrounding yourself with experts. You know, when we look at, um, I see a lot of pitch decks, I see a lot of companies pitch, um, and I see a lot of really young founders pitch, first time entrepreneurs, first time founders, first time raising capital. There's a slide in every pitch deck that's who's your team. And that team doesn't always have to be the people you're paying a full-time salary to. That team also encompasses this list of advisors and experts who are there guiding you. Those might be clinical experts who have come in, those might be physicians that are championing that product, or that might be a business advisor, a business mentor who's been there, done that, has their own track record, and they're attaching their name to you because they believe that you're the kind of entrepreneur that can take this to the next step. One of our attendees says, uh, I'm, an, I'm an innovator, but I have very little financial resources. What does it cost to access your service? Yeah, so we have very affordable programming. It would depend on what that uh, company uh, is looking for, what uh, program we would put them in, but our uh, starting rate to access our incubator program is $250 a month. And that provides you with significant, significant support. Uh, that, that can be an hour of a business professional's time. And you have several of the, that person's hours each month you're provided with wraparound services, you're provided with access to facilities. It is extremely important um, to be able to reduce that overhead expense for entrepreneurs because they do have limited capital and the capital they have, we want them putting that back in their technology. Uh, what resources are there for learning what grants are available to support an innovation entrepreneurial effort? Yeah. So I would say first starting point would be going to either your local incubator or maybe the tech transfer office at a university. Um, again, Google is a great resource. Um, there are some federal grants available, uh, some state grants, um, but 
grants will only get you so far. They are great to start to build the basis of the technology and to hire your initial folks, but they certainly will not get that. Uh, you cannot rely on grant funding alone to completely commercialize a, a healthcare technology. Jessica, I'm being told that your video keeps freezing, so maybe shut your camera off and maybe that'll help with the audio. Okay, sorry. So, no, not a problem. Um, okay, so let's go, let's move on. So during, here's another question, during a time where so much across our country seems divided along those socio-political lines, are you seeing more barriers to collaboration or more opportunities? That's a great question. I, I would, I, I continue to see more opportunity. Um, I think that um, we, we who want to drive progress find ways to work together to make progress happen. And uh, we, we try to ignore, ignore the noise that, uh, that halts and slows down progress. When did you become interested in medical innovation? I would say uh, that started um, working in technology transfer and working with faculty members who were creating medical innovations. Uh, one of the first products I worked on was actually with a, a mathematical faculty member who was working on an algorithm for uh, developing is ischemia uh, challenges and in rhythms and it was very interesting to write grants around an algorithm which doesn't necessarily everyone thinks of a product a, a maybe an implant or um, a technology but this was an algorithm that would be implanted and sort of into um, existing systems and it was just fascinating to hear this individual who was using math to solve healthcare challenges so <laughs> This it sounds so incredibly difficult on so many levels just to get started. So what advice would you have for somebody who just wants to create a collaborative ecosystem in their own environment? Yeah, I think it starts with understanding what do you have to offer and then understanding what's missing. Um, sort of doing your own customer research about the ecosystem. Um, that's going to take conversations. It's going to take you know, your own first person research, but are there existing solutions that maybe are just not being um, marketed very well? Um, and I, I'm a big proponent of looking for existing solutions before creating new ones. But if you're trying to start this sort of collaborative ecosystem, it's what are the gaps? Who's in there trying to fill the gaps? Um, see if you can make com uh, connections where other people might mutually benefit. Um, Try to find decision makers and policy makers. Um, and I, I think there's there's examples where there's people who want innovation, but they're putting in place policies that might make it hard to be creative. So if you can access decision makers and sort of try to affect that policy, um, that starts with the, the root of a collaborative ecosystem. So... Uh can you talk about some of the successful innovations related to healthcare that your company has helped uh, find funding for and develop? Sure, there's a, a couple startups I, we're working with right now through some of our, um, we call them entrepreneurs and residents, our business advisors. Um, one of them is Auxilium Health. That's uh, a really cool wound technology that has a, a visual representation if there's um, a, a bacteria or infection present um, sort of changes color to let you know that there's infection present. This is a, a young postdoc, first time entrepreneur, recent you know PhD graduate who is just doing amazing things. Um, so he's raised a few hundred thousand dollars and is now looking to raise a larger round. Um, there's a company uh, called ScopeMed, which has an example of a company that has also made some pivots that has a, a nasal cannula that they're commercializing. Um, we supported uh, a company a few years ago called OrthoBrain, which went on to raise uh, over $10 million uh, in the orthopedic or the orthodontic space. How many of your uh, innovators are under the age of 30? Any idea, especially relating to healthcare? I don't know that I have that number off the top of my head, but it's actually less than you would think. There, there are more, I would say, over the age of 30 innovators, but um, 
this is why we we want our university students thinking about entrepreneurship and innovation as a viable career option. So do you find that a lot of these folks who come to you, they've already kind of tried everything else and then, oh, they realize that bounce exists? Um, maybe not necessarily. They might find us first. Um, they generally, um, I would say kind of related to your last question, maybe they've been practicing for a period of time and they've developed their own solution and um, they've either been connected to us, you know, we're, we're pretty well connected in Northeast Ohio. So we, um, we are a lot of people's first landing space, uh, but there are times that, that we have certainly gathered um, entrepreneurs who've, who've been through other programs. Dr. Langell mentioned Kinetic, a joint venture that you will be leading. What can you tell us about it? Yes, that is um, very, very exciting. And I, I wish I could show you my face, <laughs> my camera is off about my big smile. Um, this is, I think, the culmination of everything I just said over the last you know, 20 minutes uh, is that this is a comprehensive set of service offerings that's designed to support healthcare innovation. Um, this collaboration was formed over a period of two years of meeting between our leadership team and uh, Neomed's leadership team. And Dr. Langell and I shared a vision of how we could work together to address what we both saw as a sizable gap in Northeast Ohio, um, and then really spent time to understand what we understand what we both brought to the table. Um, but at a, a high level, um, our kinetic is sort of three things. The first is access to core facilities. Um, entrepreneurs need access to spaces like wet labs and high-end prototyping labs, uh, spaces to conduct preclinical trials. Um, they need access to commercialization support that has wraparound services. So we need mentoring, we need business advising, um, we need their help with go-to-market strategy and fundraising, but these companies also need regulatory support. They need to understand reimbursement strategies. Um, they need to be able to cover some of the legal expenses. So that's the second component. And then the third is this access to industry and clinical expertise. Uh, you know, this is through universities, through hospital systems, through corporate partners. Startups need feedback. That feedback cycle is essential to taking a product from early idea into hopefully a business model fit into that successful environment. And without access to that, that is that is a huge barrier for an early stage startup to just, you know, you, you can't just knock on the wall of a hospital and say, I need to talk to a doctor. Um, that's not going to work. You need to have someone who can help you make introductions to the type of care provider who can give you the right kind of feedback for your idea. What do you find are the biggest mistakes people made before they came to you or, you know, they weren't aware of things that they had to be aware of? Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest mistakes is spending a lot of money prototyping a product before you get that relevant feedback. Um, we have seen companies or individuals spend a lot of, and this is the hard part, a lot of their own personal money to invent, uh, or I should say prototype or develop a product that unfortunately the market doesn't want or wants uh likes the solution, but feels like there are some changes or some tweaks to it. So one of those first things is not getting that initial customer feedback. Uh, there's an attendee who would like to uh, uh, get more contact information for Bounce. I can tell you bouncehub.org is the website. Is there anything else they need to know, Jessica? No, that, that's, a, that's a good starting place. Our, our um, info email address is info at bouncehub.org. So if you don't know where to start, that goes to, to several people's inboxes. Um, and if you are interested in programming, we always suggest that you go ahead and just apply to programming. And even if you're not ready, that's okay. It doesn't mean you're going to have to pay or get stuck in a program. That's a great way to get you in front of a team member who can help assess where you're at. And if we're not the right first step for you, we that, that's really core to bounces. Um, you know, operating model is that if we're not the best step for you, we will take you to the best uh, organization in town that can help you. This is a great question. Um, are there opportunities for innovations that could bring positive change in the area of social determinants of health? Absolutely. Uh, the university hospitals and Neomed actually um, hosted a 
conference uh, several months ago um, on this topic area. There were incredible ideas. It was so sort of like a hackathon. And even just from that 48 hours, incredible ideas came from that. So for me, it absolutely, it's understanding the problems, understanding the barriers of bringing those solutions to address those problems. And then it's going to take a collaborative approach to solve um, the challenges around the social determinants of health. Are you aware of any innovations that Bounce is taking on that um, may deal with that subject? I'm not, not off the top of my head. Okay. Um, folks, we still have some time for a few more questions. Please put them in the Q&A. Um, meanwhile, I wanted to, <clears throat> to ask you about, uh, I know, I know you said there were uh, areas for people to get um, help writing grants. Is that one of the biggest setbacks for people, like not knowing how to do that or the process is just so complex? I would say that more so than that is just sort of knowing how to get started. Where, you know, do you, um, who's that person? Who's your entry point? Where Who's going to at least help you maybe form an, an LLC and, and think about what the next steps are? Um, I think the, the grants can be overcome. I would say the, the biggest challenge is really determining how your solution can solve what the market wants. Does Bounce have specific program uh, programming to support the needs of entrepreneurs from diverse cultures? Yes, so we have a whole track of programming um, that is uh, really focused on serving minority and women entrepreneurs. Um, uh, particularly, we have a, a early stage program called Aspiring Entrepreneurs that helps people with this very topic of customer discovery, understanding what is your business idea solving or filling in the community. And the uh, second one, we have actually a licensed program from Cincinnati called Mortar at Bounce that is um, very much rooted in the Black experience and designed to support um, Black-owned businesses. Are you seeing more uh, diverse business opportunities coming into Bounce or ideas rather coming in that uh, you didn't expect to see before? I guess I wouldn't say that I wouldn't expect to see, but we do have a, a very um, diverse set of clients that we serve, um, which I guess, which to me, looking at the makeup of our community and our region, it, it is not too surprising. Do you, uh, do you work with public schools to develop young entrepreneurs and innovators? We don't. We, we wish that we could be all things to all people, um, but there are some amazing uh, organizations and nonprofits that work in this space um, that we support and encourage that organizations continue to work with, but we just don't have the bandwidth to, to go that far. We do, I will say, uh, host a lot of field trips. We do bring a lot of um, uh, students through our building to see that, hey, this is, this is part of your community. This is part of Northeast Ohio. There are opportunities like this to get involved. Um, so as you go through your educational journey, make sure you find your way back here. Would you advise any of our attendees who may be thinking of one day becoming an innovator or an entrepreneur, do the same thing, go get a field trip? Yeah, absolutely. We, we love, we love visitors here. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, here's, here's a question for you. What is your wish list for the new year? Oh, my wish list. How many businesses are you going to get off the ground? If you will, we'll start there. I would, I would hope that we, I don't have last year's totals yet, but my hope would be to get close to 250 clients that we serve this year. Um, that's across all programs. Uh, really, really excited about our work with Kinetic. So I'm excited to get more of that public facing so that we can really bring entrepreneurs into a comprehensive set of services. Um, this, uh, this is my second year as CEO of Bounce, and we are uh, working on a current strategic plan. So uh, my wish for that would be for our strategic plan and our strategic direction to be uh, solidified soon so that we can start running full sprint that direction. What's an average number of businesses that you that Bounce helps in a given year? Uh, generally, we serve just about under 200 a year. This 2023, I think we might've eclipsed that number. Um, so hopefully we can just keep ramping upwards.
Do you ever work with diet and nutrition entrepreneurs? It's a good question. I'm racking my brain to think back. I'm, I th we have lightly touched a company in the microbiome, microbiome space, but, um, uh, just because we haven't doesn't mean that we can't or that we won't. I was the microbiome space, uh, a physician from university hospitals who got a business started. I don't actually know which, you know, or, or which hospital system he's with, but yes, in Northeast Ohio, uh, pretty, pretty famous, I would say. Yeah. Uh, company. Um, all right. If anybody else has any other questions, I'm going to allow Jessica to give her final thoughts before we hand it back over. And I'm not seeing anything popping up. Oh, here we go. Are there federal dollars that are untapped for innovators? And if so, where can one find more info? I don't know if they're untapped necessarily, but there are federal dollars through NIH, National Institute of Health, through Department of Defense, through several other um, departments in the federal government, generally um, seen through the Small Business Innovation Research or Small Business Technology Trans small business technology transfer grants. Um, but there are others. Uh, grants.gov is a great place to search for um, grants that can uh, serve uh, and support innovative startups. All right, Jessica, go ahead and give your final thoughts. No, I just really appreciate uh, everyone's time and being able to share a, a, pace, a space that I'm extremely passionate about. I hope that that comes through. I hope my screen is sharing appropriately as I um, want to be able to recognize that. Um, but thanks everyone for listening. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, my email is on Bounce's website, so I'm not, it's not uh, easy for me to hide. So please feel free. We'd love to support your work. Thank you so much for your incredible insight. I, I have a feeling a lot of people have a much better idea of how to start an innovative business from this point forward. All right, Dr. Langell, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Monica. And Monica, thank you as always for your expert moderation. Jessica, thank you for a compelling and engaging talk. We appreciate everything that you do to support the startup companies in the region. I wanna make sure that we recognize university hospitals for sponsoring vitals. Uh, they're an important partner and a key player in the healthcare in Ohio and setting a benchmark nationally. Please join us next time for vitals on February 1st and we will hear from Nina Shore, the deputy director of intramural research for the National Institutes of Health as she speaks on leveraging leadership to affect innovation. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay engaged. Thank you. This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action.